We'll just get started and welcome Scott <laughs> Scott Lewins from <laughs> University of Vermont. I'm reading, I'm reading these chats as they pop up, sorry. <laughs> um, and Scott's going to be talking about integrated pest management today. So Scott, I'm just going to let you go for it. Because Heather mentioned, I'm going to be talking about integrated pest management in hemp. Um, my name is Scott Lewins. I'm an entomology extension educator with the Northwest Crops and Soils team. Uh, I am super jazzed about this presentation, despite all of the technical difficulties. Um, for those of you who are not entomologists, um, right now is the virtual um, conference of the Entomological Society of America. And actually right now in that virtual conference is a session on um, hemp pest management. And so all morning long, I was brushing up on my, um, the latest, um, integrated pest management information and frantically editing uh, this presentation to include some of those updates. So, um, can't seem to, there we go. I will talk about identifying and, and managing those pests in hemp uh, here in the Northeast. Uh, I'll spend most of my time um, focusing on the, mo the most common and most uh, damaging uh, insects and arthropods but we'll also um, talk about some of the good guys out there um, because that's important to know um, uh, when you're thinking about your management strategies. And then also talk about the, the common diseases uh, in, in hemp, uh, at least in the Northeast. Um, and go on to talk about just some real basic integrated pest management in hemp, um, kind of the economics that underpin and talk about the various management strategies and some of the resources available to Northeastern growers. So by far the most common uh, insect out there in our hemp fields are cannabis aphids. Um, there are other aphids that you can find in your hemp. Um, the hop aphid, for instance, really common, uh, closely related aphid species. And the way you can tell those, the, the cannabis aphid, um, is they've got these little horns on the on their head, which make them a little bit distinctive, different than um, other um, aphids that are out there. But basically, all aphids that you're going to find, you're going to manage in the same way. They're they're found on the leaves and the stems, um, and um, I just want to move this chat over in case I uh, see any uh, issues that people are. Um, that are popping up for people. Um, so the, the aphids, they have winged and wingless forms. Um, the mothers uh, actually give birth to pregnant daughters. Uh, kind of this crazy, like blow your mind. Um, but th they, they have asexual reproduction. Um, and so because of that, their populations can grow really quickly uh, in a pretty short period of time. They have winged and wingless forms. Um, the winged forms um, occur when the conditions are um, poor, uh, and it, it's a, an evolutionary adaptation which allows them to uh, um, to make it over to to disperse, excuse me, um, to areas that are more hospitable. Um, as the the season changes and the leaves change in color, so does the color of the aphids. So they start out this sort of pale color. Um, and then they turn almost like a pinkish color. And what they're doing is they're sucking the life out of your plants. Um, they feed on the phloem. Um, and uh, generally, you don't see any symptoms re related to the, the life being sucked out of the plants. Um, what happens as populations grow over the season, so in, the, you know, in July, you might have two or three aphids per plant. Um, but the end of August, you could get upwards of two, 300 aphids per plant. Um, and that um, all of the life getting sucked out of the plants can reduce plant vigor. Outdoors, aphids are not generally an issue. Um, you can get sooty mold um, that forms as a result of the, the sugary honeydew um, that's secreted. But generally, again, outdoor plants are not susceptible. Indoor is a whole other story. You can, you can have complete crop failures. Um, but we're really focusing on outdoor production, uh, or at least I'm focusing on outdoor production for this. Uh, Two-spotted spider mites, also a really common uh, pest in Vermont. They're pretty small. You can see them with, your, with the naked eye. Uh, the adults have the two spots where they get the name from. Um, they, all of them have sort of a pale color 
Uh, you can see the, the, the exoskeletons that are, are discarded after they shed, and also the eggs on the underside, along with um, the symptoms, this flecking or um, stippling, sometimes people refer to it. And then really high infestations, um, you, can, you can start to see that webbing where they get their name. Just like spiders, they can spin webs and then they live underneath that webbing, protected from natural enemies, protected from uh, insecticides uh, and the like. Hot, dry weather is when those populations really explode. Hemp russet mite, to our knowledge, is not present in Vermont, uh, and it's a good thing. Uh, I was actually just right before this watching a presentation by Whitney Crenshaw out in Colorado um, talking about hemp russet mite management, and it's really, uh, really troublesome. And so people are, are on the lookout for hemp russet mite, but again, as far as I know, hasn't been found in Vermont. Uh, I did talk to a grower who believes they had it on some um, plants that they got from the South last year, um, but didn't see any, uh, sorry, a grower in New York, if, if I didn't mention that, um, who, who thought maybe they had them on their um, plants brought up from North Carolina, um, but didn't see any, um, any this year. So that's a, that's a good, um, good news, right? So these guys you cannot see with the, um, you cannot see with the naked eye. You do need magnification. Um, but what you can see is the, the symptoms. Um, they, the, the feeding um, can lead to a bronze color and sometimes a slight upward uh, rolling or curling called tacoing. Uh, unfortunately, tacoing is not a, a, a diagnostic characteristic. So you can have some, some phenotypes, actually tacoing is, is normal. And then in other cases, the feeding of of hemp russet mite um, doesn't cause that. So really problematic, but again, we don't have to deal with that um, yet in Vermont. European corn borer, um, as the name suggests, these guys prefer crops like corn. Hemp is not preferred, um, but if you have a scenario where there's not corn in the ground, um, like we had uh, was it last year, 2019 growing season was pretty bad. Uh, people couldn't get their corn planted in time. And so the first flight of European corn borers, um, the moths were looking around for a suitable host plant uh, and there was uh, plenty of hemp in the landscape. Um, so, and that or first generation, that first flight, I should say, um, the moths will lay their eggs on the stalks and those stalks can lodge. Um, in most areas around here, you can get two generations. So if you get enough degree day accumulation, you get a second flight um, at the end of summer. And that second flight, those caterpillars, um, the result from the second flight are the ones that will burrow into um, buds and cause damage like this picture on the right. Um, and you get an unmarketable flower. Japanese beetle. Um, these guys will feed on, you know, hundreds of host plants. Uh, in our area. Thankfully, hemp is not really favored. Um, the, the grubs are those little C-shaped grubs that, that live underground chewing on plant roots, um, but there's not a lot of hemp roots um, when the, the larvae are present in the soil. Um, the most patriotic of all pests, uh, Japanese beetle, emerges right around 4th of July. The adults feed for about a month uh, and they have that characteristic skeletonization uh, of leaves. Um, and then they're pretty much gone. So they, they, have, they are very visible, their damage is very visible, um, but they don't really do much in terms of uh, effect on yield. Uh, flea beetles, these, there are multiple species of flea beetles. Um, they all have this same characteristic shot hole damage on the plants. Um, just like Japanese beetles, the larvae are in the ground feeding on plant roots. The damage, just like Japanese beetles, uh, from the leaf, uh, sorry, from the, the larval feeding underground is really not significant. Um, so when you have large populations of, of flea beetles on really young plants, and so um, that the first generation of adults, so they overwinter as adults and then emerge out in June and early July. And so you've, if you've got seedlings um, or transplants that are young, at the same time as flea beetles, that's where you have a problem. Otherwise, you don't really have a problem. There's a second larval generation where the, Jap where the flea beetles um, emerge as adults towards the end of the summer, but at that point, the plants are large enough that any damage is not really gonna impact them. 
There's a bunch of leaf hoppers that uh, you can find on hemp, but potato leaf hopper is by far the most common. Uh, so all leaf hoppers um, have this sort of same elongate body. Um, the nymphs sort of scuttle around on the underside of the leaf. The adults have uh, wings um, and they can jump and fly, but the 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 larvae, excuse me, the nymphs uh, cannot fly. So these guys, at least the the potato leaf hoppers, are blown in on wind currents in early July, uh, sorry, early June, and they'll have multiple generations, and they also suck the life out of your plants. Um, the feeding re results in cell death, so they jam their mouth parts in, and they they release a um, saliva that that breaks down the cells, and so you see that hopper burn. Um, which is as a result of the feeding. Once you've seen that, um, the damage is already done. Um, but again, thankfully, these guys don't generally prefer hemp. Um, and so although you can see the damage on hemp, it's, it's um, not as bad as something like a soybean or something like that. Thrips. Again, multiple species of thrips, not as much of a problem outdoors, more of an indoor problem, but it's worth mentioning them. They also have these small elong elongate bodies, but even smaller than, um, than leafhoppers. Um, their feeding is that, uh, uh, creates that sort of streaking color, and then you also see the black spots. Um, the black spots are actually a as a result of the, the feces. Um, these guys have multiple generations um, and really all insects, their, their development is, is um, temperature dependent. Um, and so thrips, um, particularly when the temperature is nice and warm, uh, those multiple generations can, can build up over time. Uh, ligus bug, there's multiple species of ligus bug, tarnished plant, plant bug being one of them. Uh, I mentioned this uh, only because it's, it's a really a more serious problem for uh, grain hemp. It's not as much of a problem at all for, um, for hemp if you're growing just for flour. Um, but these guys, like potato leafhoppers, have um, piercing and sucking mouth parts. They suck the life out of the plant, but they like to focus on younger tissues, um, particularly the developing flowers and developing seeds. And so you'll see these um, sort of oval shaped People sometimes mistake them for beetles, um, but their, their wings are a little bit different than beetles. They actually have a half membranous, half hard um, front wing. So that's how you know it's a tarnished plant bug. Um, and they, again, really, it's only a problem if you're, if you're growing for grain, so your oilseed crops. Because what happens is when they jam their mouth parts into the, into the developing flower um, and developing seed, that distorts the, the development um, and can lead to abortion of the seeds or deformed seeds. Um, and so that is why they're problematic. So if you put all that together and you think about, all right, what are those pests that I'm dealing with uh, over the course of um, the season? There are some pests like, um, like aphids or two-spotted spider mites that will uh, over time as the, as the season goes on, those, those populations will slowly uh, increase. And then you've got other things like European corn borer or flea beetles where there are distinct um, generations. Uh, and then other species like potato leafhopper um, where there are multiple generations um, that occur throughout the season. Uh, and again, hemp russet mite to our knowledge is not here, so that's why I just have it as sort of an asterisk. It's important not to just know the bad guys out there, but to also know um, those good guys, right? So lace wings, um, are great. There's a picture up here on the top left of the adults, but it's the, the larvae that have those big honking mouth parts that, um, that can eat quite a few aphids uh, in one sitting. Of course, all of our favorite, well, at least my favorite, um, ladybugs, we've got adults and larvae um, that go to town on aphids, minute pirate bugs uh, and parasitoid wasps, not present in as much uh, or as many numbers, I should say, um, but but uh, are great. We're grateful to the help that we get from, particularly the parasitoid wasps. They lay their eggs inside of a, um, a, let's say, a developing egg, and then what you wind up with is another parasitoid wasp instead of um, that the um, pest insect. A um, couple others I'll just quickly mention: spider mite destroyers. We'll come back to those guys. Um, they're specialists. Um, and predatory mites. There's a bunch of species of predatory mites that that um, you can purchase. Uh, hoverflies are great. They've got 
predatory maggots that are just aphid um, eating machines. Uh, and a couple others that are generalist predators, spiders, um, stink bugs, uh, all good things. So it's really important to understand not just the bad out there, but the good, because again, that could impact your management decisions. Uh, I am an entomologist, but I, I do have to talk about some of those um, diseases that are really problematic um, in, in hemp, not just insects all, all afternoon. So uh, gray mold, or botrytis. Um, these guys are, um, this is probably the most common um, pathogen in hemp in the Northeast. Um, those, the, the gray part of the gray mold, those are asexual spores or canidia, uh, and they form on the top of the uh, canidia fours. So that's what you're looking, when you, looking at when you see the, the gray mold. And so those canidia, um, canidia, excuse me, land on a on a leaf surface, and then they germinate um, on that surface. They infect the cells, and they kill the cells, and then um, and invade the tissue. And then you get that so, um, that rot color. Uh, sorry, that rotting tissue underneath um, where those cells had died. Um, it's it's. Particularly problematic, botrytis is particularly problematic because uh, in some cases, uh, if the conditions are not favorable for, um, for growth, they can go into this sort of suspended animation, this special um, structure that, that forms that they can overwinter um, or get through in hospitable conditions. Whether they're in living or dead plant tissue or soil, um, it doesn't matter. And so that's why it's challenging because you don't need the live host. Um, and so, and so it's gonna be things like sanitation, um, removing um, all plant material um, and rotations are really, really important for botrytis because of that, that characteristic. Um, botrytis is worse when the humidity is high and air um, is not moving around. So providing adequate spacing uh, is really, really crucial. And you can, you can scout the flower buds as they mature, you know, end of August, beginning of September. Uh, and you really want to get rid of any plant debris as soon as possible, uh, infected plant debris as soon as possible. Powdery mildew, the other most common um, disease for, for hemp, at least in our area. Um, powdery mildew is less likely to survive without a host, although I was reading something recently that said that, that, that it too can produce specialized structures to sort of survive um, during um, uh, inhospitable uh, periods, um, but not as much as, as botrytis. Um, and so the, that white, what the quote unquote powder, um, those actually um, strings of, of spores. And those spores can be carried by the wind. Um, so um, wind, uh, sorry, airflow is really important um, because is, is if you've got decent airflow, um, those spores that, that land on the surface of the, the leaf are not going to uh, get a chance to, to infect. Um, these guys, uh, the powdery mildew um, pathogen is favored by relatively moderate temperature and high humidity. So obviously it's a bigger issue indoors. Um, and it sounds like there are at least some varieties of hemp that um, may be coming down the road that are, that are um, resistant to powdery mildew. So uh, it's important whenever possible to find, uh, to, to grow varieties that, that might be resistant. So in the, this is what that might look like in the field. Um, say the end of July, you've got uh, these leaves and you'll start to see this little bit of, um, you know, it looks almost like dust, uh, but it's, it's definitely distinct patches. Um, whereas, you know, if it was just like, if, you're, if your hemp's along a dirt road, your, your entire leaf might be covered with dust. Here, there's these little circles of dust. Um, and that dust is those, again, those chains of, uh, of mycelium. And the end of the season, you've got a big problem on your hand. Um, you ultimately wind up with a, with a failed crop if it gets really, really bad. Uh, sclerotinia or white mold um, is another one that's pretty common. Um, this, uh, it, it, I think Heather mentioned this last time, is particularly important um, if you if you're thinking about rotations, because this guy, the, the pathogen can survive in the soil for, for multiple years. Um, and they also, um, the same pathogen um, can attack multiple broadleaf crops and weeds. Um, so um, soybeans and vegetable crops, uh, it's the same pathogen. Whereas with 
something like powdery mildew, that pathogen that's causing powdery mildew in, um, in hemp is not the same pathogen that's causing powdery mildew in, say, um, pumpkins or something like that. So um, for, for sclerotinia, it's really important to rotate non-host crops, um, things like things that are grasses, cereals, um, corn, that sort of thing. Uh, and then also um, weed suppression is really important because the, the pathogen can survive on, on broadleaf uh, weeds that might be in the field. Uh, there are a bunch of leaf spots that uh, affect hemp. Uh, septoria leaf spot, to my knowledge, is the most common uh, that we deal with. Uh, it's really common outdoors, um, more so than indoors. Uh, it's really important um, to think about splashing. If you've got, so in the case of uh, septoria, if you've got uh, plastic mulch down, you can avoid some of the splash of the soil back up on the plant, uh, and that's really helpful. Um, and also destroying effective, um, affected, excuse me, plant debris at the end of the season uh, is, is important for, for septoria because um, the, the pathogen can survive on, on alternative hosts. I think Heather mentioned that uh, last week as well. Um, just one thing to think about for indoor growing, uh, if you're growing up your seedlings or, or, um, or clones, um, pythium root rot is a common problem indoors. Um, really common, you see the outer cortex of the, of the roof sort of slough off. Um, that's a really common uh, diagnostic character. Um, so it's an issue for seedlings and transplants, particularly because that, that pathogen can cause damping off. Um, and so you, you um, want to be really important. Uh, sanitation is really important uh, managing for this one um, so that you don't bring uh, diseased plants out into the, into the field. All right, so really quickly, um, just go over the basics of, of integrated pest management. Um, there's a couple of terms um, that, that it's important to think about. So there's injury, that's the, the, the physical harm or the destruction that's caused by the um, pest or, or the um, activities of the pest, right? And then, that's, and then that's different than damage, right? Damage is, is the actual monetary loss of, um, as a result of the, the injury. And so really important two questions to think about is um, how much loss is the pest actually causing uh, and how much will it cost to control? Um, take the example of the Japanese beetle. You're, you're, um, you see the Japanese beetle feeding. Um, there's a lot of plant material that's being removed. Uh, actually, I saw a really awesome presentation by Katie Britt down in um, at Virginia Tech this morning at the, at the virtual conference I mentioned. So she did an experiment where she clipped leaves um, of both grain and also um, um, hemp for, for flour. And she found that you can remove 50% of the leaf material and not impact yield whatsoever, uh, not impact the, the, um, the CBD production or THC production at all. Right? So it really doesn't matter, at least the, the, the take home message from, from Katie's work was, it doesn't matter if Japanese beetle are feeding on, um, on the leaves because the plant can, can sustain quite a bit of damage and the Japanese beetles are gone before the flowers is even uh, being, uh, is even developing, right? So um, it, it, you're not losing anything um, by that feeding. Now, if you are losing money, then, then really want to think about how much money you're actually losing. So uh, let's think for a moment about um, this hypothetical pest population. Um, you've got on the right-hand side, got this little graph right here. Um, on the x-axis is time, and on the y-axis is the, is the population density of this hypothetical pest. Uh, it's important to consider two population levels. Um, the economic injury level, um, that is, um, when the cost to control is equal to the amount of economic damage cost caused by the pet pest. Also, you want to think about um, if you have that pest, you have to manage it with an insecticide. There are costs associated um, with those management actions. And so if those costs are less than you're potentially losing, uh, then it makes economic ses sense to take those actions, right? Uh, if, if you take those actions, and it often takes a little bit of time in between what you did uh, and receiving the benefit of what you did. And so that's where you have the economic threshold, which is set beneath the economic injury level. You want to take action before you're actually um, standing to lose any money. 
Now, this is a, essentially an economic model, and we don't, have, um, the, we don't have thresholds established for hemp. But it's important to think about this, the, the, the same framework, even if we don't have those established thresholds. Because if you feel like you're going to be losing money, again, it's worth taking action. Um, you want to just make sure that you're aware that any of the actions that you might be taking can have unintended consequences. Right? So that's why we want to think about all of the things that you can do uh, before taking any sort of um, you know, chemical approach. Um, that's essentially the basics of integrated pest management. Um, in integrated pest management, the focus is not eradication. It's you're understanding that the pests are going to be there, plan for them to be there, and um, do the appropriate things uh, to mitigate losses. Um, so there's really a strong emphasis on monitoring. Um, that's why I spent the first half of this presentation on what those pests are, because you have to understand what is out there. Then you have to go out, see if they're out there. Um, really, there's a strong emphasis on proactive um, strategies. So things that you can do ahead of time uh, to, to mitigate potential losses. Um, things that you might do yourself, what we call cultural controls, mechanical controls, um, biological controls that you can either release um, or benefit if they're naturally occurring. Um, and if all of that proactivity is not effective at maintaining pests below that threshold, um, then uh, you use uh, chemicals as the last resort. Now this is, again, this is the basics of integrated pest management, but they're really important for hemp because we have so few chemical options. So even if your philosophy is, is, um, is um, you know, congruent with using chemicals, you, you just don't have a lot of options um, to, to, to go to. And so that's why IPM in hemp is even more important than many of the other crops that, that folks might be um, accustomed to working with. Uh, so Anne Hazelrig and her lab um, developed a couple of scouting sheets. So Catherine, I believe, made these, um, the PDFs of these files available to you. Um, feel free to use them if you want. Um, use whatever, whatever you're accustomed to. The important thing is that you're doing your scouting on a regular basis. So um, the, the sort of the generic recommendation is at least weekly scouting. Um, so this is the, the disease scouting form that Anne developed um, in there. She's got some basic procedures for how you um, cover the field. Typically, you want to walk in a W-shaped pattern through the field, making a consistent number of, of steps in between your stops. Um, in this scouting sheet, it says 20 stops. If you've got 10 acres versus a tenth of an acre, obviously, you're going to alter your, um, your scouting appropriately. Um, you're looking at multiple leaves on multiple plants um, so that you get a good picture of what's happening out in the field. Uh, make sure that when you're doing your scouting, you're bringing things like, you know, a clipboard, pencil. Um, I always have my, my smartphone because I can take a picture. Uh, I can email it right away. Um, have some extra plastic bags, a Sharpie, uh, in case you need to take a plant sample um, and submit it uh, for diagnosis. Uh, so this is just a snapshot of of the arthropod scouting form, very similar to the to the disease one I just sent. The only difference is um, those pests that you might be uh, um, encountering. It's about one o'clock now. I think Heather said she had to take off. I know some of you probably were planning only to stick around till one. Um, so we're going to keep this going, uh, and I'll finish out and and this is being recorded. So if there's anything that you've missed. Um, feel free to come back and, and watch. And, and if there are questions that you um, didn't get uh, answered, um, the email address at the end of the presentation uh, is perfect. And so I'm just going to keep going uh, for another 20 minutes or so uh, and then answer questions if folks are, are still around. So there is help out there. Um, the important thing, again, is your scouting is you know what you're looking at, um, because before you do uh, anything, you want to make sure that you're, that you're addressing the, the appropriate problem. Um, so as you're scouting, you, as I mentioned, you bring your smartphone. If you have one, you take dim, digital images uh, of those 
pests, um, make sure those, dim those images are in focus, um, or you, you actually get the, the physical samples um, and you submit them. So this is a snapshot of some information um, for main growers, um, but basically the, the same information that you wanna submit um, is, is, it's consistent no matter what state you're in, right? So make sure you have your name and your phone number so they can get back to you, um, where you, where you, um, where you, where you have scouted the problem, um, when you scouted the problem, um, and when those, those symptoms first appeared. Um, and so again, this uh, information is available through the e-extension website for this week's material. So I'm gonna go through the next couple of slides pretty quickly, but I did wanna point out that, that most states in our region have uh, a facility that, that can accept um, disease and insect um, uh, samples. So in Connecticut, uh, I don't know if Suresh is on this call, but he has attended some of our previous um, webinars. Um, so he's great to, to connect with in addition to some of the other um, resources in Connecticut. New York has both uh, insect diagnostic lab and then the plant di diagnostic lab for, for um, samples. Unfortunately, Massachusetts, um, their diagnostic clinic does not accept hemp samples. Um, my understanding is that that hemp growers in Massachusetts um, just send their stuff to Vermont. So Anne Hazelrig, as I mentioned before, is a tremendous resource for us here in Vermont. Um, again, just like in Maine, she accepts emailed um, and physical uh, samples. Um, and then of course our program, um, we're always willing to help out with identification. So Heather or me um, or any of the folks on our team um, and, and uh, feel free to, to reach out at any point. All right, so you've diagnosed the problem um, and you wanna make sure that you know how to deal with it. So uh, some of the cultural controls, these are the things that you can do. A lot of them are proactive, as I mentioned before. Um, so you wanna think about um, what those potential pests are gonna be before the, the beginning of the season. Um, and really most of the cultural controls, it, it's, it's crucial to understand the biology of the, of the pest before you even think about how you manage it um, because um, the biology dictates the management. So take the example of botrytis, gray mold versus powdery mildew, right? So you're not gonna wanna just bury the botrytis infected plant material. Remember um, that pathogen can persist in the soil long after the plant material is gone. Right, whereas powdery mildew, um, it, it's less likely to, the pathogen that causes powdery mildew is less likely to, to persist. So again, understanding the biology is crucial um, for these proactive um, cultural and mechanical controls. Um, we'll take an insect example, um, you know, the plowing. So turning up your soil uh, is really important um, because you can potentially expose um, those, so things like um, Japanese beetle larvae or flea beetle larvae that, that are in the soil, right? If you're, if you're bringing them to the surface, you're exposing them to the elements, you're exposing them to natural enemies. Um, and so again, understanding um, what pests you have, their biology um, can help dictate those proactive um, strategies um, before, before the season even starts. Um, I don't really spend a lot of time working with weeds, but but particularly for pests, um, you know, where where leaves might be an alternative host, right? Not only keeping the weeds down is important just for weed management, but it's also important for the the pest management um, uh, that of the pathogens or or insects that might be harbored by those weeds. Um, and so again, that's why you know we'll put a, a an extra an extra plug in for weed management on that one. Uh, in some cases, adjacent trap crops can be effective. Um, take the potato leafhopper example. Um, potato leafhopper prefer things like alfalfa, right? And so it's not gonna work for every pest, but um, depending upon the biology, if you've got an adjacent trap crop of alfalfa um, and you get a flush of um, plant hoppers that land on your alfalfa, you could potentially sp um, spray that trap crop and um, and kill those potato, potato leaf hoppers, or at least leave that trap crop alone and hope that the, the leaf hoppers are, are, um, are gonna spend more of their time focused on something that's a little bit tastier for them. Um, and just one final thing in terms of 
um, transplanting from the greenhouse into the field, uh, whether you've got seedlings or, or clones, um, making sure that you've got nice hardy seedlings um, will, will enable them to um, survive some level of pest um, uh, damage. So if you've got leaf, uh, excuse me, um, flea beetles, for instance, as I mentioned before, if you've got um, if, if you've got flea beetles coming in and your plants are, are you know, little measly things that you've just transplanted, um, they're less likely to survive that flea beetle damage uh, in June. All right. Uh, these are all indoor. Uh, again, the focus of, of what I'm talking about is outdoor, um, but, but a, lot of, a lot of outdoor production, as I mentioned, if you're dealing with seedlings or clones, starts indoors, right? So again, these are all sort of common um, generic indoor um, cultural controls. Um, a lot of, you know, thinking about sanitation, you know, if you've got um, pythium that you're worried about, making sure that your surfaces are clean. Um, you know, if you've got a lot of the fungal pathogens where, um, where temperature and humidity is important, you know, lowering the PA, excuse me, lowering the, the relative humidity and bringing the temperature up a little bit, help dry things off. Um, providing adequate spacing. Again, these are all sort of generic indoor um, um, strategies for, for minimizing uh, pests um, before they then go out to outside. You don't want to be bringing problems out into your fields. So biological control um, is an area of, of particular interest for me, um, depending upon, again, the understanding the biology of your pests will dictate what what biological controls. Um, here you also have to understand the biology of the, the, um, the biocontrol agent. So parasitoids like a trichogramma, um, great for lepidopter, uh, caterpillar pests. These guys um, lay their, I should say gals, lay their eggs inside of a caterpillar egg. And so instead of a European corn borer hatching out, um, you get a, another um, parasitoid wasps. They're great. Um, aphid, aphid midges, aphidolides, um, they just go to town on aphids. Um, Neosilus, the a predatory mite, is great for spider mites. Uh, another um, predatory mite, Stradiolalips. Um, I, I haven't tried this myself. I've been assured that these are great for, for chronic spider mite problems. Um, the, and the reason being is they, the, um, the predatory mite will overwinter in the soil. Uh, and so then you could potentially get lasting control from them. Uh, and they also will control a lot of other soil um, pests as well. And so um, this is something that I think has, is an area of um, potential um, for sure. Um, again, because of that lasting control potential and also the, the fact that it, it's multiple pests. Um, spider mite destroyers are great. Um, these are naturally occurring. Um, they are a little, actually a ladybug that specializes on spider mites. Um, you can buy them, uh, but they're, like I said, they're also naturally occurring. Um, so one of the questions I always get is what, you know, where can I get these guys? And I'm not, um, I'm not, I'm not promoting any of these, but these are two of the, the probably the widely, uh, widely used um, sources. So our sort of quote unquote local supplier, um, Carol Glenister is the, the entomologist at IPM Labs out in, in New York. Um, they're great. A lot of Vermont growers work with them. The sort of big organic, if you will, is, is Arbico. Um, I think they're out in California. Um, but again, a lot of different suppliers. Um, and really what I'm most interested in is promoting naturally occurring predators. So the, rather than paying money, and sometimes a lot of money, um, for biocontrol agents and not being assured that they're actually going to um, stick around when, when they get here. Um, if you have ladybugs or you have hoverflies or lacewings that are, that are already in your fields, why not just do things that you can um, to encourage them? So um, providing alternative food sources. So a lot of parasitoid wasps, the adults, um, their survival and, and fecundity, how many eggs they can lay. Um, is impacted if uh, you have like floral resources, flowering plants. Um, so you'll often see strips um, either in um, fields or along the edges of fields. Um, structural complexity um, will favor things like spiders. Um, also um, thinking about if you are gonna be applying any insecticides, um, you know, conservation spraying, um, making sure that you're, that you're not gonna be you know, killing off all of the beneficials um, 
at, at the same time that you're attempting to kill off your, um, your pests. Uh, so I am a certified applicator in Vermont. I can't really say things about other states, so I, I, I am beholden to the law. And remember, the label is the law. So the most important thing, whatever state you're in, is you make sure you know that you're following the state um, um, laws. And so there are a couple of, of websites that I like using. Um, both of them have national um, sort of maps, and then you click on what state. Um, the Kelly registration systems, what Vermont uses um, for their pesticide um, registration. And so you can go in um, and, and make sure that you're using appropriate um, uh, appropriate products in the appropriate um, crops. So as I mentioned before, um, there are, we're very limited when it comes to uh, chemical applications uh, in hemp. Uh, and so if you go to Kelly's Solutions website in Vermont, I went, I think on Friday, there are only 28 products. These are all pesticides um, that are available. And a lot of them are, are duplicates. You'll see the um, regalia. You've got four different regalia products, you know, container versus what you're going to be applying out in the field, right? So there are very few options um, for chemical controls um, in Vermont. And, and I suspect that other states are, are pretty similar. And so, um, at least in Vermont, um, the state has taken, a, um, I think, a pretty reasonable approach, recognizing that there's a, there's a certain amount of, you know, if you will, red tape involved with getting a, a pesticide um, registered in a crop in a particular state. Um, and so, in addition to um, those 28 products, uh, Vermont, at least, um, if, there, if there are products that meet the following criteria, um, they've allowed um, their use. And so it's, you know, if the active ingredient is an, um, has a tolerance exemption under the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, um, contains only the active ingredient listed on the state website, labeled for use on unspecified food crops, and has agricultural use label for hemp uh, intended for commercial sales. So if you don't have those memorized, that's fine. Um, if you go to the, the state website, um, this is the list, the, the active link is down here at the bottom, um, organized by active ingredient, some examples of those products, uh, and, the, and the pesticide type, right? So in addition to those EPA registered products that you can find on, on Vermont's website, they also have this nice table uh, of additional things that, that are, um, that for now, allowable in hemp. Right. Uh, I just want to end here with a little um, let the buyer beware. Um, so Marone Biologicals, um, they're, they're a very reputable um, biopesticide company, um, and they have a bunch of products um, that are biopesticides, both for, for um, arthropod management as well as, as well as disease management. If you go on their website, um, you can download this little pest guide. Right, and that's nice. They've got it organized by the pest, and then the different products that that they have available. Right, but remember, Maroon, right? They're trying to sell pesticides. They're not worried about what's allowable in in individual states. That's your job to figure out if it's a, if it's allowable. So if you go on to the Vermont um, Kelly registration systems, you'll find that at least for the pest for the insecticides, they're EPA registered and they're registered for use in Vermont, but not at least as of Friday, registered for use on hemp. In Vermont, right? So really important that you're that you know um, what is allowable in your in your state, right? Even beyond that, you know they've got this product Jet Ag uh, Maroon, and it's EPA registered. It's registered in Vermont, but it's not actually registered for use on any crop. My guess is that it's in the process, right? And so for now, like you cannot rely on product websites. You have to go to the state. Um, that the website that for the state that you're in and make sure that you're that you're following the most up-to-date um, guidelines. So really important, know your bugs, right? Know the good guys, know the bad guys. Um, biology is going to dictate all of your actions. Um, obviously, you have to know the diseases as well, not just your insects, uh, even though I'm an entomologist. Um, I'm okay with, with talking about things other than insects. Um, and then really, again, thinking about the systems approach that we use, the, the sort of basics of IPM. Um, it, it's, it's, there's an economic um, um, modeling that, underli that, that, that underlies this framework, right? And if you're not gonna lose money, then don't spend money to control a pest, really. 
that's the important um, take home message. Being proactive uh, is crucial. Understanding the biology um, is, is their first step in being proactive. Um, there's a wide array of tactics um, that might be um, at your fingertips and, and selecting the right combination that are compatible is, is, is crucial. And then of course, knowing all of those resources um, that are available to you um, in, in your particular region.